Good evening. Well, welcome. Um, I know you're all bright eyes, bushy tails. Um, what's about the day? Just a day, right? Ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolutely a privilege to today our speaker, the best way I could describe an individual who has reached the pinnacle of what we can aspire to be ever, yet never lost, lost the touch of being a wonderful human being. That's the strength of this individual. And when I call him to see if he would grace us with his presence here and give a talk, and I was, quite frankly, somewhat ambivalent that he may say no. Then I decided to do it anyway. The reason I decided that anyway, because in my life I've had many no's. So this will be one more. <laughs> uh, but he was so humble and so gracious. And he says, this is about Hopkins. This is about all together. It's not about Carey School or A School, B School. We all in together. That's humbleness. That's a sense of humanity that prevails in this great institution. An individual, a native of Minnesota, Dr. Peter Agre, I like to call it Professor Agre, studied chemistry at Augsburg College and medicine at Johns Hopkins University. He joined the university and the School of Medicine faculty in 1984 and rose to the rank of professor of biological chemistry and professor of medicine. After a brief stint, and really is what indeed was a brief stint, at Duke University he returned to his alma mater Johns Hopkins in 2008 as the director of Malaria Research Institute at the Bloomberg School of Public Health as well as the university professor. In 2003, Professor Agra shared the Nobel Prize in chemistry for discovering echoporins, a family of water channel proteins found throughout nature and responsible for numerous physiological processes in humans as well as being implicated in multiple clinical disorders. Other honors include 15 honorary doctorates, commandership in Royal Norwegian Order of Merit from King Harold V, and the Distinguished Eagle Scout Award from the Boy Scout of America. In February 2009, he became the president of American Association of the, for the Advancement of Sciences. We have unique talent at Johns Hopkins University, and we build on the existing Hopkins expertise in research and innovation. This contributes to our unique approach for a business school. Ladies and gentlemen, it is truly a privilege to introduce to you Professor Peter Agri. Well, th thank you, Dean Guppy. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be here. And um, I, I meant what I said. I think we're really all in this together. So I'd like to welcome you to Johns Hopkins. I, I've been here off and on for 40 years. It's hard to believe the time goes so fast. Where is everyone from? Who, who is born outside of the US? Raise your hand. OK. That's about 2 thirds, maybe. That's really a global program. So who, who, Europeans, where are you from in Europe? Just call it out. Which countries? India. France. Yeah. India. That's not in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Well, any, any other Europeans? No Norwegians? What? Greece. Greece. All right, good. Uh, Middle East? Which countries, please? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, yes. Turkey. Turkey, yeah. And East Asia? OK, which? China. Who's from China? Korea. North Korea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're not really global. You will be. You will be. It'll change. Japan? OK, where, where did I not get? Uh, Taiwan. 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 Yeah. Excuse me. I've been to Taiwan. <laughs> I've been to Tungai Dashi. I know it. I know the place. OK, how about in the US? Uh, 
Midwesterners, what states? Count up, just yell it out. Illinois. Illinois. Indiana. 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 Michigan, Ohio. Minnesota, no, no. We need some of those guys out here. <laughs> so anyway, I, I thought what I would do is rather than try to bore you with a lot of facts and figures and studies of discussions of scientific details, but to share with you some of my uh, experiences as a member of the Hopkins community, because I think the, the, the message which I'd like to convey with you to you is that a lot of success comes not from just an individual trying extremely hard and being lucky, but because of the combinations of efforts of many others. And there's a story that my, my wife loves for me to tell that I'm going to share with you, because I think this illustrates what I'm hoping to capture. It tells you how to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> so, and this, this is an old story. You probably, some of you have heard it. But it, it goes uh, as, as follows. A laureate, and, and most laureates are older white guys, a little serious about themselves, often. So a laureate and his wife were on vacation. They were driving in one of the national parks in, in the west, maybe Joshua Tree or Death Valley, running low on fuel. They exited the park to go to a gas station. They came to a crossroad where there's a self-service convenience store gas station. And pulled over, the laureate's filling the tank. His wife is demurely sitting in the front seat of the car, looking out through the windshield. And an old hippie walks out of the convenience store and she recognizes him. She runs out of the car and throws her arms around the old hippie and starts kissing him and hugging him. And he's kissing her and hugging her and the laureate is pumping gas. <laughs> Click, the tank is full. He says, darling, it's time to go. So they get in the car and they drive along. And he turns to her and says, what was that all about? Now she's, she's very somber and she has a lot of sadness in her voice. She says, dear, I, I never told you about this, but before I met you, I was in love with that man and we were going to be married. Now the laureate's irritated, cuts her off. And says, well, it's a good thing you didn't. <laughs> You'd be stuck here in the desert, and after all, I won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and she glares at him and says, you don't understand. If I'd married him, he would have won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Ask my classmates in medical school. There's something else that happened. You know, it didn't just, it wasn't merit alone. It's a combination of activities of a lot of people. And I think we all came from origins, which may not be in the very beginning, predictive that we'd be at this great university doing things which we think are going to be very important with changing the outlook for the world. So in my present capacity as, as a university professor and director of the Malaria Institute, I have uh, wonderful activities that I, I oversee in Africa. Of course, this is our poorest continent in terms of material wealth, maybe one of the richest in terms of potential wealth. There's something that's missing. And of course, as much as we hope to improve the health of the poor rural Africans, we can only go so far because until there's an economy, until there's business that's established, it'll all be aid. And that's non-sustainable. Political cycles, things get voted in and out. So I think what you're doing here <coughs> as uh, members of the Hopkins community with a focus on global business, you may have the capacity to really change things more than my generation ever dreamed of doing. So I'll just tell you a little bit about myself because uh, there's, there's no magic story. And there is no destiny of winning any, any prizes, much less a Nobel Prize. I, I grew up in Minnesota. My family were Scandinavian farmers, uh, dad's side Norwegian, mother mixed Swedish and Norwegian, and I'm one of six children. Mother never went to university, but she had no opportunity during the Depression, but she always loved to read, and she conveyed that to my brothers and sisters and me. She would always read us books at night. Dad, a little more fortunate, went to university, studied chemistry at the University of Minnesota, earned a PhD, became an industrial chemist, and then a college professor. So it was sort of a split kind of family background in terms of the levels of education, but there was one thing I think as kids we, we were greatly encouraged to, to study my brothers and I would go up to dad's laboratory to do little experiments. 
their kids. You know, you're six years old and a drop of one colorless solution into another colorless solution turns it bright pink. It's like magic. <laughs> but of course, what science is, is magic where you understand the magic. So quickly we learned that this is going to be an exciting kind of way to have a life. So as a youngster, I, I, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. My dad was my hero. And I, I remember distinctly in the, the third grade, we were asked to draw a picture of what we would do when we grew up. I drew a picture of a chemist with test tubes. That's what I wanted to do. But I saw beside me my friend Jay Peterson drawing a picture of a burglar. I always wondered, <laughs> did he become a lawyer? A congressman or a lobbyist? No, he actually became a biologist. He's a primate biologist at the uh, University of Chicago. So anyway, science was king in the 1950s in the United States and around the world. In uh, October 1957, I remember distinctly coming home from an afternoon playing in the meadow across from our home with my brothers when Dad came to get us for dinner and talked about something on the news. That afternoon, the Russians had launched a satellite. It was circling the world. They called it Sputnik. And as a kid, well, you know, we didn't see any satellites up there. But this was an event that changed everything because the uh, United States, and in part not for the best of motivation, but to be competitive with the Soviet Union, our adversary, invested massively in education, particularly in science and engineering. And of course, that investment is paying off, has paid off for the last 53 years and will continue to pay off. And not just because of the, the race for preeminence in space, but what this did in terms of investment and the development of ideas. And uh, science was a big, a big part of it. We moved to Berkeley, California for a year. Le leaving Northfield, Minnesota, this Norwegian village for Berkeley, California, was like, a little bit like leaving Lake Wobegon, this fictitious village, for Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, <laughs> Berkeley was culturally heterogeneous, and it was really interesting. Dad, of course, as a sabbatical worker, met all the, the, the great scientists at the University of California, and there were many, many Nobel Prize winners, and became particularly good friends with a, a scientist from Caltech named Linus Pauling, who was a chemist, who they served together on American Chemical Society Committee on Education. And Pauling was, was remarkable because he, he had such great capacity to, and fearless approach to science, he would, he would do things no one else would even consider trying. He solved the structures of all of the inorganic important molecules. These are small salts and metals and, 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 and compounds which were, uh, are inorganic. They're not life molecules. And then he turned his attention to life molecules. He was the discoverer of the first molecular mechanism of disease. He discovered sickle cell hemoglobin, the cause of sickle cell anemia, as a chemist. And how did he do this? sharing a train compartment on a long trip. This is after World War II with a well-known hematologist. They talked about what they liked best, their work. And his train compartment included a man named William Castle from Harvard University who talked about this severe and troubling disease affecting African-American individuals, causing their cells to be misshapen, painful crises. And Pauling immediately intuited it as a great physical chemist. It must be a polymerization of hemoglobin causing this returned to his laboratory, hired a young man named Harvey Itano. Itano spent World War II in, a, in an internment camp because he was a Japanese American. No one would hire him because he was viewed as a dissident. He was, even though he was a valedictorian at the University of California, Berkeley. And together they isolated he, sickle cell hemoglobin. And now, of course, we understand that many diseases are molecular diseases. And he was a very active scientist because in addition to his great science, and he, he won the Nobel Prize for elucidating the structure of the covalent bond, the structures of proteins. He didn't get it for the discovery of the structure of DNA, which is a really interesting story. He thought it was a triple helix, you know, off by one. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he also would use all of his opportunities as a scientist to give lectures to the public about the need for engagement of the public so that they understood the, the value of science and also the dangers. And of course, this is back in the 1950s, 1960s, during the nuclear testing in the atmosphere of hydrogen bombs. So uh, World War II in, in Japan ended with the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, horrific bombs. But the hydrogen bombs were first 10 times, 20 times, 50 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more powerful than the atomic bomb. 
with the release of nuclear fallout in the atmosphere. So Pauling would give public lectures and, and initiated basically a worldwide response to the dangers, recognition of the dangers of nuclear testing. And on one occasion, this is when we were kids, we saw this on television, when <coughs> President Kennedy invited all American Nobel Prize winners to the White House for dinner, a dinner which he later re reflected had the greatest concentration of intellect and talent in the White House since Thomas Jefferson was there all alone. <laughs> so 49 Nobel Prize winners equal one Thomas Jefferson. He led a series of protests around the White House in that afternoon with placards, Mr. Kennedy, we have no right to test. This was on national news. And as, as youngsters back in Minnesota, we saw this on the TV. It was like, whoa, there's dad's friend Linus Pauling on television. Six o'clock, he straightens his tie, went into the reception where he and his wife waited in line to meet President Kennedy. President Kennedy, a very witty individual, very charming individual, turned to Professor Pauling and said, Professor Pauling, I understand you've been around here earlier today. You know, everybody knew it was on the national news. By the end of the evening, Linus Pauling is da dancing with Jacqueline Kennedy. And the upshot of all of this is that Kennedy signed the Limited Test Ban Treaty, which forbid the release, testing in the atmosphere and the release of nuclear fallout. And so that's one example of where a scientist getting engaged with the public changed the course of history. Who knows how important that was. So anyway, growing up in this background, uh, there was a lot of interest in science. I, I think in part maybe because my, my family was probably not very good at business. I think the Norwegian motto is buy high, sell low. <laughs> Must be reversed. And uh, so I, I, I focused on this. I um, did summer research at the University of Minnesota. And uh, with the idea, I, I actually wanted to get involved in, in global medicine. <clears throat> this is before the current rage in terms of global health. And, and in part, it was because of the, the influence of people that we knew. Again, the Scandinavian community in uh, Minnesota and in Scandinavia has a very strong med medical missionary movement. This is, this is not proselytizing Bible religious missionary. This is medical missionary where they start clinics in the poorest parts of the world. And people would go there and work, doctors and nurses. Uh, the governor's sister, Alice Eastvold, and her husband, Conrad, a surgeon, started a clinic in the Cameroon. And they, and they stayed there and worked there for 35 years. This was a very serious commitment to <coughs> world health. And our congressman, Walter Judd, was a medical missionary in, in China. This was not something that was unfamiliar to us. So I really came the idea that I wanted to be a medical doctor, not think, sensing I had any talent whatsoever in chemistry. In fact, I got a D in high school chemistry, but I, I could have done better, I know. I, <laughs> so I tell people, I, if I'd applied myself, I would have gotten a C, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, applied to the medical schools, which, um, any, any of you met medical doctors? Sometimes there are medical doctors who do MBAs, and it's, it's quite interesting, and uh, I think there's some room for advances in medicine. <laughs> anyway, so um, I'd applied to the medical schools, and of course the selection is most favorable in your home state because the legislature funds medical schools to turn out doctors for their state. And I had a wonderful interview at the University of Minnesota, and uh, uh, it went well. But to apply to the University of Minnesota then, and maybe still now, you had one absolute requirement. You had to take a, a, a psychological test called the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Has anybody heard of the MMPI? So I, I know they still have this. It may not be the gold standard of psychological inventories any longer, but it's you know, 500 questions, two hours, very detailed, and very personal. So I, I was sitting there at the interview answering questions, and I sensed it was going well. And the dean for the, the medical school then, the, the, for admissions, asked me, now, do you have any questions for me? I thought for a moment, well, what did you learn about me from that MMPI exam? And I can tell you that was the wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Dean Sullivan looked in my folder. He looked at me. He says, these results indicate that you lie more than average. <laughs> Then he looked down and says, but you lie less than the average medical student. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> anyway, I was very fortunate. I applied to Johns Hopkins. Hopkins having a very strong reputation, always, for its world health activities, its tropical medicine research, 
in part at the School of Public Health, but also in the medical school. And so I applied and I came out here and it turned out, of course, I was the only student from Minnesota or the Dakotas. And I looked at the catalog every, every year there was one guy from, or woman from Minnesota or the Dakotas. I realized I was an affirmative action candidate. <laughs> <laughs> Geographic diversity. No, no, really. I'm sure they could have filled their class 10 times over with young people from New York City or from Los Angeles who had higher scores, higher, higher test scores, grades, and, and mine were pretty good, but I think I realized it wasn't an algorithm that decided this. There was a sense that diversity contributes to the whole. And, and I worked really hard as a medical student, but I found what I really liked best to my own surprise was research in a laboratory working on problems of world health. Now in 1970, when I was a first year medical student, there was a particularly horrific problem sweeping through Southeast Asia and South Asia, the disease known as cholera, which is a horrific diarrheal disease, kills infants and small children by having fulminant diarrhea. They, they go into shock. They cannot take in fluid fast enough to to restore what they're losing. And the molecular basis of this was, was solved by a, a, a scientist at the University of Texas, we, uh, the isolation of the cholera toxin. And the problem of traveler's diarrhea, which was worldwide, not just Asia and Latin America, became a target of research. I mean, what is causing traveler's diarrhea, which was very prevalent in Mexico, places like that. So as a medical student, I, I decided I would work on this. I worked with Brad Sack and, and uh, the cholera program at Hopkins over at the Bayview. And the research labs were over the Bayview at that time. And we got pretty far along, but I couldn't isolate the toxin to, to purity. And again, as a first year medical student, without a PhD in biochemistry, motivation, but not a large amount of experience, how did I make my way through this problem? And, and the answer is by talking to the people in the lab because they were so rich in their scientific background and so interesting and so colorful, it totally changed my idea of what science is about. This laboratory was, was organized by a, uh, a young Spanish-born scientist. He grew up in South America because his family fled in Spain because of the Franco regime. His name was Pedro Cuatacasas. And his laboratory came from all over the world, and they worked on problems of membrane, cell membrane uh, receptors and the like. And, and I found it so interesting and so colorful. I mean, the, the laboratory had people like Ignacio Sandoval, this jet black bearded Spaniard who was an intense anarchist, pseudo communist. <laughs> and who should work beside him was Gianfredo Puca, this debonair patrician Italian, handsome, handsome. My wife thinks he's the handsomest man in the world. <laughs> he, 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 part time as a student, would play the role of gigolos in Italian movies. <laughs> And he had some other interests. He was a downhill ski racing champion. And his girlfriend, who he married, was the heiress to the Vespa fortune. So, you know, what would someone like this want to do in science? Gianfredo's father was a famous Italian neurologist who always said, Gianfredo, you will become a scientist. You will become an academic. And so he did the logical thing. He decided he would solve the most important problem any Italian male could conceive of. And that would be the molecular basis of femininity. <laughs> and he did. He isolated the estrogen receptor by affinity chromatography. It was in nature. It was big news, you know. And Jean Fredo, of course, was in the lab. He was, he was so sexy that there was a constant stream of secretaries, unlit cigarettes, kind of sashaying by. <laughs> back then, smoking was allowed. He'd be there to light their cigarettes, but serious scientist. <laughs> One summer, we were joined by Naji Sahyun, a brilliant young biochemist physician from Be Beirut, from American University in Beirut. Any, anybody here from Lebanon, Beirut? No. The uh, Naji was truly brilliant, but his family were Palestinians, and he carried with him intense hatred of the treatment of the Palestinians by the state of Israel. And he bore a tremendous prejudice. He bore it quietly, but those of us who became his friends realized, and he was very suspicious that American Jews were all Zionists. And so Naji, who should he work beside but Marvin Siegel, this roly-poly, pleasant son of an Orthodox rabbi from Brooklyn, New York, and they became the best of friends. I think there's something very special that happens when young people from different cultures come to universities and work together on an important problem. And so as, while I found the research itself very exciting, I thought this whole idea of being involved in world science with representatives of different cultures was, was the most exciting. 
And while I can say working on diarrheal diseases wasn't always such a, an advantage in my social life, I mean, <laughs> in fact, I remember going to Goucher College. Goucher used to be women only, <clears throat> now it's co-ed. Nice college outside of Baltimore, and so Hopkins was male only. They went co-ed also. But they had these mixers, and I remember meeting this attractive young lady, a Goucher mixer, and she finally asked me, Peter, what, what kind of medicine do you think you'll specialize in? And I said, I'm really interested in diarrheal diseases. That was, the, that was the end of that conversation. But I, I, went, I met my, my future wife, Mary, who worked for Richard Johnson in the neurovirology laboratories at Johns Hopkins. He's a farm girl from, from Ellicott City, Maryland. And uh, we fell in love. And she, she always set some limits, though. If you're going to work on diarrheal diseases, keep your work at work. Don't bring it home. <laughs> So the problem with cholera, of course, is the release of fluid into the intestine in uncontrolled and, and huge volumes. And when I joined the faculty in 1984, having trained as a physician and as a scientist, I had the opportunity to pick anything I wanted to work on in the whole world. I mean, that's really a pretty, pretty wonderful opportunity. But, there's always a but, I had to get funded to do the work. So there, that's the challenge. And it's probably not different from the challenge that you in, in business will find. Conceiving of an original important project which you can actually accomplish before the other guy does it is sort of something we share. On the other hand, in, in science, we have the advantage <coughs> of having the ability to write grants, funding agencies to foundations. I think business also has startup funds seeking the help of investors. And in the end, one thing worked, another thing worked, and we grew to be a small laboratory and uh, had um, an interest in red blood cells, in, in part because uh, I worked in a laboratory where red blood cell membranes were being investigated. And, and I won't get into the science, but basically red cells can be isolated from our peripheral blood. I mean, any blood donor gives half a liter of blood you spin it down, <coughs> excuse me, half the volume of red blood cells. You wash them, you, so you have pure cells quickly from humans, and the membranes are quite simple compared to other cells. So we were studying these and decided we would do something very novel and very important. It was so novel that I think everyone assumed it had already been done, and that is to understand the mo molecular basis of the Rh blood group antigen. So rhesus, the Rh blood group antigen, is, is very important because during pregnancy, Rh negative women, which are 15% of people, it's normal to be Rh negative. If your Rh negative women are pregnant with Rh positive babies, they can become immune, immunized, sensitized during birth, and then have antibodies which will circulate and could then harm or kill subsequent pregnancies. So it was understood how to manage this, but it wasn't understood what the protein or what the antigen was. Was it a protein or a lipid or a carbohydrate? And <laughs> with the help of colleagues, we were able to actually solve the problem. But in the process of, of solving this problem, there was a contaminating protein in our preparations, which we thought was a breakdown product of RH, which turned out to be totally unrelated. Basically, I think a wiser and more focused scientist would have stayed on RH. It's important. It's clinically important. It's, it's, it may provide some useful insight. But having a little bit of attention deficit sometimes is a good thing. And I kept coming back to this contaminating molecule of 28 kilodaltons because it was interesting. And it turned out to be exceedingly plentiful in red cells. But it didn't stain. When you isolate proteins, there are stains, ink-like molecules or uh, substances which will allow you to identify the protein on an electrophoretic slab gel, for example. And this one didn't stain, but by some radio labeling techniques, we knew it was there and we raised antibodies to it, and we decided we would sequence it. So we were learning about it, trying to describe it, but one thing we didn't know is what does it do? Because the function of the protein determines its importance. Having a protein of 28,000 molecular weight, a membrane-spanning protein with no known function equals like no tenure, no, 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 no advancement, no grants. <laughs> and so we were stuck. Now, this is a little bit of a diversion, because at the same time we were doing these studies as a, as a younger scientist, I was in my mid-30s at that time, uh, my, my wife, uh, who was home when we had children, 
we, we would, on a basic scientist salary, decide every year we were going to protect at least two weeks for a family vacation. And the vacation as a scientist, a basic scientist that you can afford is a vacation in a tent, which actually turned out to be great. We took the kids camping to all the national parks. We drove our old Chevy Suburban out to Yellowstone, Black Hills, we got some frequent flyer miles to fly to the west to go to Yosemite and the Grand Canyon, and the glacier. And so every year we'd go to the national parks, different parks. And after doing this about seven or eight years, we said to the older kids, I guess Sarah was about nine at the time, said, what national park do you think you kids would like to go to next summer? And all four of them yelled, Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not a national park, but we compromised, we went to the Everglades. We went to Disney World, and by dri when I'm driving through Chapel Hill, where I spent three years as a postdoctoral fellow, we stopped to see some friends. And whenever I met scientists, I'd talk to them about this new protein, because it really bothered me. We had this new protein. It had to have something interesting. It lived in the membranes of cells, and, and I talked to John Parker. John was a professor of hematology who was a very, very uh, accomplished physiologist. And I told him about this protein which existed in red blood cells and in tubules of kidney, and there were homologous, related proteins in other organisms, bacteria, the lens of beef cattle eye, uh, tissues of plants. John, John put it all together. He said, Peter, have you considered, these are very water permeable tissues, have you considered this might be the long sought water channel? And I hadn't considered that. In fact, I was totally clueless that there was a long sought water channel. But sometimes you know nothing, and you have clever friends, you catch up in a hurry. And so, on his suggestion, we collaborated with Bill Gugino here at Johns Hopkins in the Department of, of Physiology to test this new protein's function by injecting the eggs of frogs with RNA prepared for the gene, we, the, the, the DNA we'd isolated. So you inject RNA, the, the frog egg makes the protein, puts it in the membrane. And frog eggs are about a millimeter in diameter, they're like a, a large pencil dot. And frogs designed these through evolution to be very, have very low water permeability. Why? Because in the spring, frogs lay eggs in freshwater ponds. Unless they're fertilized, nothing happens. They, have negligible osmosis. So we thought this is a good expression system. So we injected the RNA, cultured them. They looked the same, no difference. Transferred control oocytes to distilled water. Nothing, 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 nothing. Looking through a microscope, nothing happened. Then we transferred our, our test oocytes with this new protein to distilled water, and they popped one after another like popcorn. It's just like bang, bang, bang. It was like you couldn't hear it. But it was pretty dramatic. One experiment, you have it, which created a lot of interest. And, and being kind of uh, less advanced in terms of the understanding of membrane physiology, it, it took a while before the importance of this discovery was made apparent to us. We were pursuing it very hard. We got our initial reports and realized that if we were going to continue in this field, we we're going to have to team up with other scientists. And we already had been doing this. I talked about quite a few of them that helped us along the way. Because by, by ourselves, we probably would have gotten nowhere. Anyway, over the next few years, our laboratory, joined by com competitors and collaborators around the world, were able to isolate what we now call a family of water channel proteins called the aquaporins. And humans, like other mammals, have, have 13 aquaporin genes. Plants have these, uh, in, 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 the, in the world genetics database, there are hundreds of aquaporins. And in, in mammals, they do some interesting things. For example, the protein aquaporin, one that we discovered, is present in, not only in red cells, but in uh, choroid plexus, the tissue in brain where cerebrospinal fluid is secreted. In the aqueous humor secretory epithelium in eye, in, uh, Capillaries, or capillaries will release water. Too much water comes out, we get edema, swelling. In our airways, uh, the humidification of our airways, on a cold winter day you see your breath, that's because you're exhaling not just carbon dioxide, but water vapor. And a part, part of that is to, to wetten the surfaces of our airways so we can clear bacteria. And our kidneys will concentrate a large volume of primary urine our kidneys will filter about 50 gallons 
of plasma every day. It's the same plasma again and again. And then they will reabsorb 99% of the water. <clears throat> if it didn't reabsorb all of that water, we would have tremendous polyuria, inability to concentrate. And if you don't think that's important, <clears throat> next time you're on a jet airliner and the seatbelt light is on and your bladder is full, just think of aquaporin too. And these others all have clinical significance. The aquaporins in brain also include aquaporin 4 which controls the entry of water into brain parenchyma, which occurs after brain injury. So when someone sustains a stroke or closed head trauma, the neurologists are very concerned, not about just the initial injury, but is swelling going to ensue? Because our crania are fixed. They protect our brains. But if an injury still occurs, there's no room. If one part of the brain tissue swells, it will compress adjacent brain tissue, permanent brain damage results. So all of these have relatively important clinical features to it. I think glaucoma will be another area where too much fluid secreted relative to the amount that's reabsorbed. Uh, it's quite clear that cystic fibrosis is a water problem in lungs. The, the genes where the mutations occur is not an aquaporin. So this, this created a lot of interest. And of course, other, other um, uh, organisms, plants, for example, use aquaporins in their rootlets to take water up from the ground and then by transpiration, release water from their leaflets. And this is all organized by these aquaporins. And so this, this got to be very interesting. I collaborated with numerous people around the world, in J Japan, in, in Switzerland, in, in Scandinavia, in Germany. Uh, we had young people coming from many different countries. I think, I think we've had young people in our laboratory from about 25 different countries who came, worked incredibly hard, and discovered something knew about this field of aquaporins. And so um, as a scientist, of course, you're, you're very excited. Discovery is very important. To, to work on a problem that's been defined by others is kind of incremental, and you, you may be able to publish papers and get grants. But the real joy comes from an original discovery. And the recognition for this was, was a little, little overwhelming at times. I would get many invitations to give lectures including uh, just about every year on invitation to lecture one event or another in Sweden. And of course, if you, if you give truth serum to scientists and ask them, have you ever thought about the Nobel Prize, the, the, the answer is yes, of course, a little daydream we all have. But, you know, it's a daydream. It, but enough people would ask us about, gee, this sounds like a Nobel discovery. Didn't want to take it too seriously. In fact, I remember one time flying to, uh, to Stockholm to give a lecture, a special lecture at the Karolinska Institute. That's the medical school in Stockholm that awards the Nobel Prize in medicine. And I'd flown all night. <clears throat> and uh, if I remember, I turned in my business class ticket to get a cheaper ticket. <laughs> Don't tell the IRS, please. It was four <laughs> kids. Anyway, so I arrived in the, the morning, pretty beat up, got out. At Arlanda Airport behind the business travelers to go through the pass control. And of course, the business class guys were first very, very dapper briefcases, and the pass control officer individually asked everyone the purpose of your visit to Sweden. And the business passengers each said, business, stamp, passport, next. Finally came to me, he says, what is the purpose of your visit to Sweden? And looking rather disheveled, I said, well, I'm here to give the Karolinska research lecture. And the guy looks right at me and says, are you nervous? <laughs> I said, well, yes, I am a bit nervous. He says, you should be. <laughs> and a couple of years later, early in the morning in October, the phone rings, and it sounds like the Swedish chef on the other side. I thought I knew who this was, and it was the Nobel Chemistry Committee. And in and, and truth, there were, there were some signs along the way that this was going to happen, but I kind of kept that to myself, but uh, anyway, I was, I was pretty jubilant. Although, in truth, my, my, uh, my first question for them was, with whom will I share this prize? I was hoping it wouldn't be this vicious competitor we had from California, because I'd like to murder the guys. <laughs> no, no, you'll share this prize. I didn't say anything. I just asked for who, with whom I'd share the prize. I said, Roderick McKinnon from Rockefeller University, who's an outstanding uh, scientist, uh, like myself, a medical doctor who's working on ion channels. He solved the structure of the potassium channel, which is very important in, in nerve activation and muscle contraction. 
So I thought, yes. <laughs> I ran down to the shower, to get ready for the day. And my, my wife, Mary, quicker than I am, called my mother back in Minnesota. Dad, the chemistry professor, had died in 95. This is 2003 now. My mother's living alone uh, out in Minnesota in her apartment. And uh, again, she's a, she's a farm girl. She never went to a university. But she's very wise in what is important in terms of one's life. And so Mary said, Ellen, I think you'll be pleased to know that Peter will share the Nobel Prize in chemistry. And apparently, apparently my mother then thought for a moment, she said, Mary, tell Peter that's very nice, but don't let this go to his head. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't think she was being cynical. I think what she was expressing was, you still have to do something important. You know, prizes are great. You know, for a while people celebrate, and after a while you're a footnote. And you still really need to do something useful. And I, I think that's pretty wise, pretty wise advice. Although when I got to work that morning, it had gone to the heads of the young people. By 10 in the morning, they'd already drained several bottles of champagne. <laughs> and the most amazing thing was President Brody. He, he's now out at Salk Institute, you know, a wonderful man. But President Brody I, came over to see me. And you know, until that moment, I had no idea that we were such close friends. <laughs> <laughs> And I uh, went to my office, the voicemail was jammed with requests, and there was a Lair News Hour in the New York Times, and all this heady stuff. And then I came to a familiar voice, one of our colleagues, and we collaborated with dozens of scientists, and this is one of our Norwegian colleagues. And the voice was very clear on the message. It said, Peter, Peter, we've just heard the news. It's unbelievable. And then there's a pause. And then the voice comes out, no, 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 I, I mean, it's believable. It's believable. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> and um, the, the life was pretty crazy. The, even the cut rate liquor store up on New York Road near where we live, Wells Liquor, instead of on the marquee saying the price of Budweiser, it says, congrats, Dr. Agri, like, uh, as if I'm their best customer. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, we all went to Stockholm. We had a really, really interesting time. Uh, Dean, Dean Miller from the medical school came, uh, Dr. McCusick my first chairman, and Dr. Lane, my chairman in biochemistry, both came. And, and it, it was wonderful. It was also wonderful to, to get through that and, and get back to work. But what I didn't realize is it doesn't really end. And so you sort of have to make some choices because you suddenly become a public person. And most of us aren't ready for that. I certainly wasn't. And how do you deal with that? And um, the choice is, well, you, you have to really either be com completely ruthless and not ever talk on the phone, and, or you're going to be traveling constantly, giving talks and meeting with people. And it occurred to me that that's really what I hoped to do eventually anyway. At about age 50, I thought I would kind of back off on the lab side and get involved in things I felt were really important, like global health, human rights, science diplomacy, and in part because of the Nobel, I've had the opportunity to do all of those things. And I think whatever science we're not doing now, others are doing. We've trained young people. And I think that's a really important thing as a scientist, and I think also as a business leader, to not keep it all to yourself, but be looking for talent, young people to get started, inspired in their careers. Because there are many ways to contribute. And in the human rights area, I've chaired the Committee on Human Rights for the National Academy of Sciences. And this is a pretty serious situation. Most of our work is behind closed doors, but by negotiating in private with brutal dictators, we can gain the release of political prisoners who are scientists or academics or health professionals who are, who, whose rights are, are being jeopardized. And in global health, with the interest in malaria, we've gone further and further into malaria. And I was delighted. I, when I was down at Duke, I was the vice chancellor. I thought it was a nice job. But to head the Malaria Institute at Johns Hopkins was really, that was something I really thought would be the best possible thing I could do. So by doing that, we have wonderful research activities with many discoveries. Many of these could be commercialized. And the people are all here. They're, they're in Baltimore. They're over in the School of Public Health or at the Homewood campus or in the medical school. And uh, I thought that was important. And the third thing, science diplomacy. I've been, been active as president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I've led science diplomatic visits to Cuba, to North Korea, to Burma, where nations exist with governments which are very hostile to our government. And, and I don't intend to be political here. But the fact is, below the surface, they also have 
citizens, and they also often have scientists, health professionals, engineers, people who want to do the same thing that we want to do, and that's to make better lives for their children and their grandchildren. And we're able to get into these countries. And it is, it is really quite a challenge. I was in North Korea in, in December, and it was a little bit like a John Le Carré novel, I have to tell you. But at the end of the week, I think the North Korean scientists, we, we agreed to work further. And there's a new, met, a new university that's opening in North Korea, which will be an English language university in which some of us will be invited to lecture. I think we make our advances where we can, and good things will happen. So North Korea is a particularly difficult situation because it's the most remote. It's referred to as the hermit kingdom. But they have 23 million people living there. <clears throat> and I don't know if any of you are from Korean families. Koreans have very high aptitudes for science, strong work ethic, and there's going to be a tremendous opportunity when North Korea finally opens up for business. I think it's something you don't want to miss. And I'm, I'm sure it will happen. So anyway, um, I think that's probably enough about me. I'm supposed to answer some questions. Um, I'm having a good time. I can't imagine anything that's more fun than what I'm doing now. And I truly mean what the Dean Gupta said uh, to meet with you and welcome you to Johns Hopkins. We're, we're a big family. I think we're all in it together. It's sort of a grown-up university. People don't come here for the football team or the <laughs> basketball team. And some people come here for lacrosse, but it's a pretty small thing. It's a, it's a community of scholars, and there are many ways to contribute. And I think the Kerry Business School, our newest, our newest school, has a lot of us really excited. And with that, let me thank you for the invitation to be here. And if, if you do have any questions, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks. OK. Pick somebody to ask a question. Otherwise, it's, we've got time to go. <laughs> if you were to describe, not in terms of science, but in terms of what would be for these young people to say, how would they succeed? What is the three things they need to have to mm -hmm. succeed in the business career? Well, or any career for that matter. In science, I often tell young people, it, it's not about aspiring to win prizes. It, if it happens, it's great. And in a few years, you'll be a footnote. Quick now, who won the Nobel Prize in 2003? <laughs> <laughs> who else won it? I bet you can't remember, can you? You have to go look it up. So it's not about prizes. I think in science, and maybe business also, I think the first is an original discovery. And I think in business, it'll probably be an, an, an original endeavor. You, you don't want to put huge effort into doing that, something that 10 other groups are doing. And originality is in part related to a little bit of attention deficit a little bit of having really intelligent friends you'll confer with. I and mean, that's what I was trying to communicate. It truly wasn't me. It was me with these advantages. So I think an original discovery is important. I think very, very, very much it's important to, main to maintain or obtain and maintain the respect of your peers. Because in science, as in business, there are cutthroats. And some of these cutthroats become very successful, but sooner or later, they, they basically fail or get burned out. And for whatever wealth they, they gain, it probably wasn't worth it. It probably wasn't worth it. And I think conducting your, your affairs with the, the highest level of integrity and fairness. That doesn't mean you're not competing, but you're doing it ethically. I think that's really important. And the third thing is to educate the next generation of scientists, business leaders, that's what you're here for. And so I, I think basically in science and probably in a lot of academic affairs, that's what it's all about. And of the three, what's the most important? They're all important. You can survive without making original discoveries, but it's less exciting. You can survive breaking the rules, but don't get caught. <laughs> and you don't even have to get caught because if enough people believe you're breaking the rules, you're already guilty. And if you're not going to train the future in your field, then it's like a, a short-term event. It's like having no future that will live beyond you. 
So I, I think that's what I would, I would say. What else? I don't know. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should have fun when you're doing it. If you're doing what you really are cut out to do, it doesn't mean it's all jolly, but it's fun. If, if you actually like to go to work on Saturday, <laughs> you know, you have, to, you have to negotiate with your family on these things. When you have kids, someone's going to raise the kids. So if you're a couple, you have to split these things up. And in our case, Mary decided she would stay home when the kids are small. And of course, it's totally unfair. I'd come home Saturday evening and, Daddy! And they'd want to wrestle and throw their arms around. She was there all day with him. He's like, thanks a lot, kids. <laughs> but yeah, I think having fun is, is part of it. And when you're successful, it's fun. Yes, please. As the, as the new kids on the block here at the Cary Business School, how do you suggest we form relationships with people at the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health? Yeah, th this is a challenge because everybody's so busy, and, and oh, we've got to write a grant. And it's like, it's always hard to get people to look up for what they're doing. But I think invite them down, maybe have some planned events. You could maybe even get a bus go up there. We can have things together at the School of Public Health. I, I know the leaders of the university pretty well, and I have to say they're wonderful. President Daniels, I just spent uh, two and a half weeks with him in Africa. He wanted to see the public health endeavors in, in rural Africa. I mean, that's quite an opportunity to spend that time with, with the president of the university. He's, he is committed. And I think if we don't meet each other, <clears throat> it's much harder. And of course, the SICE program in Washington is wonderful. We don't have a lot of contact with them. And the uh, Applied Physics Laboratory, you need a security clearance. So you know there are limits. <laughs> but here in Baltimore, I think you've got a lovely place here. Throw a party. <laughs> and I think more important than you meeting us old guys is to meet the young people, meet the students. There's so many amazing things that happen when people get together. And I, I haven't even told you about Solomon Snyder, who was a young assistant professor who worked in the next lab to me discover the receptors for opiates, how painkillers work, and a and hundred other equivalently important studies. He was the chair of neuroscience. He's still on the faculty. He, very nice man. Or Bert Fogelstein, who was my classmate, very eminent cancer research, researcher. I mean, they're, they're all around. And they're not all around all at the same time because people travel so much. But I, I think and also get, getting like families involved, spouses involved. It's, it's sort of hard, a hard sell to tell your faculty you're going to have a, a weekend retreat and no families involved. <laughs> but I think, I, I think you'll, you'll find people receptive. And if people squawk, give me a call. I'll go enforce it. I know the School of Public Health, they'd be very happy to get together. And you just never know where things are. You might be Linus Pauling sitting next to Bill Castle and come up with some unique possibility. Yes, please. Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, have you ever worked with uh, men from business world to commercialize some of your discoveries in your lab? Because I'm um, uh, yeah. a <coughs> discovery market uh, in our program. And uh, I sometimes, uh, you know, the scientists talk with businessmen yeah. about commercializing such a uh, patent of technology. Like, do you have any experiences to share? Well, my, my experience is rather limited because I think the aquaporins are so fundamental that the systems in, in biology are, are uh, re reduplicate. There are alternate pathways. So individuals who have mutations in these usually get along well, so they may not be good drug targets. That said, I think there are commercial opportunities there. If we could inhibit the brain aquaporins, and prevent brain damage following strokes and injuries. Stroke is the third leading cause of death in the United States. And the death is usually the brain edema, not the infarct. Often it's the same thing. Individual sustains a stroke, 48, 72 hours later, the brain edema is uncontrollable. So <clears throat> developing practical ways of doing that has been pretty tough. There are others that do it, and they're much better at that than I am. So on the other hand, I had an opportunity while I was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of North Carolina to do my research at the Welcome Labs. And the reason I did that is because Pedro had gone to become director of the Welcome Labs. And I had a really interesting opportunity to work with a lady named Trudy Ellian. Trudy Ellian, um, it's, 
she's a chapter in Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation. Trudy Ellian, born to a poor Jewish family in Brooklyn, New York, um, in the 1920s, wanted to be a scientist, but it was always told women can be science teachers, but only men can be scientists. And she was engaged, World War II breaks out, her, her fiance is shipped off to Europe and is killed in the first wave of attacks. And uh, uh, she's, she's left alone, and decides she wanted to follow her dream. And of course, during World War II, women could get jobs that they couldn't get otherwise because there were no men around. And so she became a research technician at the Burroughs Welcome Company, which was at that point in, on the Hudson River, New York. Anyway, so she worked with this brilliant synthetic chemist named George Hitchings who could synthesize analogs of, of known compounds, but he didn't have a clue what they did. And so uh, the, <coughs> the nucle nucleic acids that go into making DNA and RNA, of course, were understood at a molecular level, and he would synthesize variants of these. And Trudy Ellian very dutifully and very imaginatively developed pharmacological assays and found out that these compounds had remarkable properties. Azathioprine is one. It's the mainstay for the prevention of gout. 6 fluorouracil is another. It's one of the initial chemotherapy agents, as a host of others. Um, Imuran, mainstay for the prevention of organ transplant. These are currently used medicines, uh, organ transplant. Um, uh, acyclovir for the prevention of herpes. Uh, AZT, mainstay in the treatment of AIDS. Trudy never got a PhD. She was a laboratory technician who got promoted through the ranks, and she and Hitchings shared the Nobel Prize. So it, it, your, your fortunes are not always linked directly to your academic bullets in the business world. But I had a chance to work with Trudy, and she was really wonderful. And uh, while she had a very modest life, it wasn't about her making money, but the Burroughs Welcome Company did extremely well. And of course, they are now uh, <coughs> bought up by GlaxoSmithKline. But all of the profits for all of those years were into something called the Wellcome Trust in the UK, or the Burroughs Wellcome Fund in the United States, which distributes money for research on third world diseases. So good things can happen in the business world. Without the business side, there'd be a bunch of test tubes on a rack somewhere. <laughs> so I think, I think the opportunities are there. They're not always so obvious, though, are they, in retrospect? Yes, please. Um, in New York Times interview, and you mentioned earlier that you said that the science community should be included to bring North Korea to the, uh, the dialogue and open up North Korea. I was wondering, um, how do you think the leaders in business, uh, leaders in science and business, can do to um, bridge the difference between sure. the sociological and political difference? Well, you, you've picked a very difficult situation. <clears throat> So we went into North Korea on December 10th. I, I know it was December 10th because that's the Nobel Day in Stockholm when they give the prizes. And <clears throat> I think we were the first American scientists in probably a generation or maybe longer that had gotten invited into North Korea. Anyway, we followed Stephen Bosworth, Secretary Hilton's envoy, special envoy for North Korea. He, w he came in and left, and we went in. We uh, got our visas in Beijing. The, uh, the Chinese foreign ministry were very enthusiastic that we were doing this because they're very worried. PR China is North Korea's closest neighbor, but they're still very distant in terms of ideology. So there was every reason to do this. Anyway, the day we came out, another group came in, and they were businessmen, American business leaders. So there's already some sense of you know, maybe the preliminary stages but then things go badly with the sinking, sinking of the Chionan, which I have to tell you from the news, it's not totally clear that the North Koreans sank that ship. Russian engineers had evaluated the wreckage and it looked like it ran aground and the, and the so-called torpedo had been in the ocean for six months. So anyway, the, the upshot is everything fell apart again. And of course the leadership of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, uh, is tenuous. His health is, is very, very uh, uh, poor, and there will be a transition there. And so uh, my guess is two years to five years, there'll be a big change there. And by not being threatening, maybe we can help them do the right thing. On the other hand, there's no guarantee. 
it's clear that there's no crime on the streets in North Korea because the criminals are all at the top. <laughs> but I don't think we should lose sight on that. And I think if we can look at Republic of Korea, it's amazing how far that country has gone. I mean, here in Baltimore, how many Hyundais do you see? I drive a Subaru myself. <laughs> Are there, yes, please. Years, you've seen healthcare develop for uh, generations and decades, decades. Where do you see which which countries, which areas do you see opening up in the next five to six years? Um, kind of vague question. In terms of healthcare, I'd say the United States. You know, we have the best and the worst. Like, would you see some a continent like Africa? Or well, a a Africa, of course is, is uh, a big challenge, and we can contribute to their, uh, that's, that's my job, that's my day job. But I also considered running for public office because I thought this healthcare legislation was so important and it's the first baby step in that direction. Because um, if, if our healthcare was so great in the United States, how come we're 26th in the world in lifespans behind Cuba? I mean, I, I, I'm not a Michael Moore advocate. I don't think we want to move to Cuba. I've been there. It's, it's, it's pretty drab. But we're not doing so well. And the statistics indicate that there are some big health problems. Big health problems. And I think that the, the problem that worries me the most is this epidemic of obesity. With approximately 30% of adult Americans being obese, another 30% overweight. And from a business point of view, this is not harmless. Average health care expenses for an obese individual are $1,500 a year above the median. Well, Maryland, if a third of, you know, so if we have one and a half million obese people, uh, $1,500, you can do the math, that's like two and a half billion dollars. What would Governor O'Malley do with, and it's not like that money is being used for commerce. That's being used to maintain blood sugar levels and amputate toes and loss of income, bad stuff. So I, I think in terms of healthcare opportunities, it's right here. And of course, there are people, I, I, I know people, Bill McGuire out of Minnesota, made probably hundreds of millions of dollars with United Health. And, and I'm glad that Bill is so wealthy. He's doing some good things with it. But it's not like the healthcare is so great. And, and you'll find out. You get a little older, you start needing to see doctors. This is not covered, that's not covered. And I go even to Johns Hopkins to see, see people I'm referred to, and it's, it's not covered by Blue Cross Blue Shield. I mean, what is it? What's the point of having this stupid insurance? I think, I think this is a, a great challenge, and that, that ought to get solved at Johns Hopkins with the input of the Institute of Medicine. And if we can't get elected officials that understand this, we've got to get better officials. I mean, in the end, it will save money. It'll be good. And it's, it's, a, it's a significant challenge. I, I, I think right here. Last question. Okay. Professor, you, you advanced science diplomacy even on shows that there's a Colbert report. Oh, so I thought I reversed it there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure your joke about having their show for two weeks helped a lot. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, how about ethics diplomacy, especially in mm -hmm. our such as today, even in business, fields of science? Sure. Have we done enough to spur on discussion about ethics? I, I think we, in part, are having sort of a crisis in ethics. Sorry, I get a little dry-throated. I think, I think, you know, I, I liked Bill Clinton a lot, but I got to tell you, that man tells lies. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's okay for him to tell lies, where, where does it stop? Where, you know, and I, I don't know how you can legislate that. I think these are the things that happen as a youngster sitting on the sofa when your, your mom or your dad is reading books or the children's Bible or other religious, you know, there's some sort of a sense of what's proper. And from a practical point of view, it makes all the difference. I mean, there was an interesting New York Times article about the uh, uh, clothing manufacturer in Italy. I think it was last weekend. And basically, 
a quarter of the Italian economy is the black economy. <laughs> it's unreported because people don't trust the, the government. They don't believe in it. And so if enough people don't stop at the red light, then nobody stops at the red light. And, and there we consider it's charming because they're Italian. And I hope I'm not insulting any Italians because I love <laughs> Italians. But imagine if that was the system everywhere. I, I think ethics are very important, but it's kind of hard. I think we had a very ethical president with Jimmy Carter, and he was marginalized as kind of too squeaky and not very, not very convincing. Maybe it's a, it's a hard thing, but it's a very important issue. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, sir. You know, is, is this, my, this is my bribe. <laughs> Once bribed, he stays bribed. Um, That's an it, honest it, man. It, it isn't a bribe because this is a Kerry Business School tie. Oh. <laughs> Should have worn a dress shirt. Let's see here. Oh, it's very attractive. Five sided flower. Thank you so much. Thank you. I like it. Ladies and gentlemen, it was just absolutely wonderful. It's, it's one of those things in you know, very few times in, in one's life you hear it's such a humble man. Uh, with that, thank you very much, and tomorrow, the class will start again. Tomorrow, and now, go and have a good time. Thank you.